tribalism in Africa laying the foundation for Europeans to come in and enslave us and ultimately colonize us. It was that tribal conflict and mm -hmm. confrontation that made yes. it so easy for Europeans to get in then and for Europeans to stay in control now. I did have a chance to meet with Brother Julius Malema. I do have to exercise a little bit of caution because he does support the LGBTQ agenda. Uh, he himself is not a member of that culture, but he does support it. Uh, he does not see a problem uh, with LGBTQ being advanced into South Africa. To something that Dr. Amos Wilson said, you know, if we don't teach our children to, to fix our current issues, you know, as far as the educational system again, you on that hamster wheel doing nothing. Your thoughts? Absolutely. Absolutely. Education and economics. And my biggest fear right now, uh, Baba Lynn, is if we don't get a hold of these youth soon, we will almost be beyond a point of no return because we have allowed circumstance, poverty, unemployment, miseducation to crystallize into a culture that the youth are proud of. When I'm looking at these elderly women who are being robbed by our sons at the ATMs, when I'm looking at these women who are being carjacked coming out of the supermarket, when I look at these young children who are being caught in the drive-bys, we have allowed the ingredients of oppression to crystallize itself into a culture that the youth are proud of. We got to get them babies back. Because if we don't, we will soon have to fight a civil war against our youth before we fight a civil war against European domination. Last question, Don. And see, what you touched on something that I've been wanting to work on. So, and I mean, the people with money, our black folks with money, and, and I don't understand why they don't, why they don't see it because it's just quite obvious to me. Uh, now we're talking imagery. To get into that mindset, we talk about imagery, producing imagery, producing things that would motivate and inspire people to do something to do right, or, or at least to be sheeple and follow a group of people that who are uh, putting uh, this positive Im imagery that is necessary because that's what's there, you know, the social media, the TV, the music and things of that nature. So, again, we have to take control of those things. What's we the problem there, Doc? The problem there, my good brother, is a core issue with us, and that is the unwillingness to accept responsibility and accountability for solving our own problems, my brother. This is at the heart of the black predicament in America. We will march. We will pray. We will protest. We will complain. We will do podcasts. We will write books. We will hold events. We will do seminars. We will take trips to Africa but we will not weaponize our black dollars to build institutional black power. I have to say it again. We have yet to systemically and collectively weaponize our black dollars so we can build institutional power. Where is the building of the banks? Where is the building of the hospitals? Where is the building of the schools? Where is the building of the supermarkets? Where is the building of the manufacturing sector to provide our people with their basic everyday needs? Where is the building of the distribution network to distribute the goods that our people need around the country and around the world? Those are the five essential institutions of any people, and we are not building them, Baba. Beauty salons and restaurants, we got a million of them. We don't need another restaurant. We don't need another beauty salon. We need critical institutions. And to that point, I'm disappointed in our millionaire and billionaire class because they're not building critical institutions. Mm -hmm. We have LeBron. We have Rihanna. We have Puffy. We have Kanye. We have Tyler Perry. We got Oprah Winfrey. We got Bob Johnson. We got all these black billionaires, and they're not thinking about institutions any more than we are. Dr. Umar, I have to ask you this question because it's, it's just kind of burning a hole in me. When is it that African leadership will stand up and say, no more? No longer are we going to be taken advantage of by you. No longer are we going to uh, send our good stuff to you and let you profit from it. Why is it that they won't stand up and say, okay, 
no more coltan you can't make another cell phone you can't make another laptop you can't make anything else with what we have until we get what we need and what we deserve for what we have what what, what is this crisis of leadership that african leaders can't stand up and do what's right for the people of their country and really for Africans all around the world. Personal agenda and political fear. Personal mm -hmm. agenda and political fear. I think one thing we have to admit, and I think this is true of global leadership, regardless of race, but of course we're focusing on ourselves. Most people ascend to leadership to fulfill a personal agenda that has nothing to do with the people. Whether that's religious leadership, whether it's secular leadership, whether it's political leadership, African leaders are no different. Many of them did not come to office to revolutionize their economy or revolutionize their society. African leaders get elected so they can prepare for their life after leadership. Their office, their administration is an investment in their personal economic future. I've seen it. I've studied it. I get messages from Africans from nearly every country on a monthly basis, letting me know what's going on over there. And it is it is pathetic. They are not for the people. And the way that they're able to continue is, number one, European capitalism has convinced Africans all over the diaspora, including us in America, that voting is the best thing you can do <coughs> to change your reality. So they have all of us hypnotized with democracy. European democracy has African people globally mm -hmm. hypnotized. That's number one. We will not think outside of voting as if voting is the only way to change things. If voting could change anything, voting would be illegal. So that's number one. <laughs> hypnotized with the vote. Number two, tribal imperialism. In Africa, just like in the diaspora, many Africans are still more concerned with their tribe being in charge than with black people being mm -hmm. free. I gotta say it again. Mm -hmm. Throughout Africa, many of our brothers and sisters are more interested in their tribe being in charge than in Africa being free of European domination. They would much rather let white people continue to exploit the resources as long as their tribe is going to be the conduit for that exploitation then they are about freedom. In other words, if I'm Igbo, I'm not voting for a Yoruba, even if I know he's the best thing for this country. You understand? If I'm Zulu, I might not vote for a Kosa, even if I know she's the best one for this, for this country. If I'm in Kenya and I belong to the Maasai kingdom, I may never vote for a Kikuyu in my life because he <laughs> is not of my culture. So until we get over that, and it's interesting you bring this up because Chancellor Williams, may God be pleased with him, Chancellor Williams in his book, uh, Destruction of African Civilization, in the opening pages, he talks about tribalism in Africa laying the foundation for Europeans to come in and enslave us and ultimately colonize us. It was that tribal conflict and confrontation that made yes. it so easy for Europeans to get in then and for Europeans to stay in control now. That's true. That's true. So That's true. Who, who do you think is getting it right? I, I watched a video just recently of the president of Uganda, mm -hmm. and uh, he was confronted by a Western reporter about uh, President Obama's disappointment with, uh, <laughs> with Uganda over it, its position in recent legislation about uh, LGBTQ agenda. Mm -hmm. And uh, the president basically responded by saying, well, you know, we're disappointed in you. We don't come to your country and tell you how to live. So what gives you the right to tell us how to live? And he used a term that I hadn't heard before, but I got it when he said it. He was talking about social imperialism, the way the United States has bullied folks around the world. That, that's what they've done with the U.S. dollar. They use it as a weapon and countries are tired of being in a position where they will face sanctions if they do something that's against the interest or the philosophy of the United States. So who do you think in terms of leadership on the continent is actually getting it right? I did have a chance to meet with brother Julius Malema when I was in South Africa. 
it was a brief meet and greet more than anything else. Uh, and I do have some confidence in him. Uh, I do think he cares about the people and will do some good if he's given a chance to be president. However, I am, I do have to exercise a little bit of caution because he does support the LGBTQ agenda. Uh, he himself is not a member of that culture, but he does support it. Uh, he does not see a problem uh, with LGBTQ being advanced into South Africa. And I asked him specifically about the children. What about the children? If you support this, you know, they're not going to stop with the adults. They want this in the South African schools. And he never really, you know, addressed that. He just said, you know, we don't support hatred towards anybody. And I wanted him to get off of the hatred uh, conversation because that's not my point. I'm not about hating anyone either, but I am about stopping in the agenda that is against the long term best interests of African people. But he made it clear he supports it. So, you know, my confidence in him uh, is not totally shaken, but I do have some reservations now because I don't understand why a Pan-Africanist leader would be supporting LGBTQ on the African continent. You know, so like I said, with a lot of our African brothers and sisters, it's about personal agenda and it's about access to power. I'm not saying that's necessarily true for Brother Julius, but I'm a little hesitant across the board when I look at African leadership. There always seems to be some sort of nuance, some sort of trump card, some sort of issue that keeps me from 100 percent supporting any of them. Yeah, that's. Yeah, that's that's the issue. And that's why I said, you know, the the, the comment I made earlier about uh, we're going to have to use a different approach. You know, our good brother Wayne B. Chandler wrote the book Ancient Future. And, you know, I think that's, you know, says a lot about what black folks, I think we're going to have to do is get back to some of those foundation foundational uh, pieces and of understanding and in order for us to move forward, you know, I, I think because the, our ancestors have laid down the track record of, and also the foundation of who, you know, and what a community is, what is necessary. And I think we, if we still engulf ourselves into that, to this uh, consumer capitalist type of approach that I don't think it's going to work for us. So I think going back and us finding ourselves and refining, refining what was laid back, it's, it's going to be the, the blueprint, I think, and, and, and helping us get through this, these trying times, I think. Cause with Absolutely. that people, cause, cause with that people would, you know, understand. And I, I don't know how long we got to get our butt kicked for this, for us to understand that the whole divide and conquer peace that they would eventually let go of this whole tribal uh, issue and just, you know, yeah, move it, forward. It, 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 it's tough. You know, black people have all the compassion in the world for others but almost no compassion for themselves. It's one of our great spiritual contradictions. We have all this patience for white people. I mean, you have black people who have <laughs> even forgiven <laughs> Europeans for slavery, but yes. they won't forgive their brother for a minor slight. You know, so we need a psychological makeover. We really, really do. And that's why, you know, for me with the Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey Academy, and just, you know, I'm, I'm really hoping to make some inroads into transforming the collective consciousness of our people through our children and more importantly, through our boys 